Banff National Park, a sprawling expanse and tourism hotspot consisting of some of Canada's most awe-inspiring scenery. This northern wonderland recently made headlines around the world for reasons that no one would ever wish for. 8.15, phone rings, I got a phone call from Garmin. We've had an SOS message. Not only was the SOS activated, but there was a message input into the inReach that said, bear attack bad. Longtime couple Doug Engels and Jenny Goosey, who were both 62, along with their seven-year-old border collie Tris, had just two weeks ago embarked on what was supposed to be one of their many adventures in the park. Doug and Jenny were highly experienced in going out on major treks. And uh, on this trek, which is, was going into a country that they have been in many times, it was like every other trek. But as fate would have it, this particular venture would take a tragic turn. Banff National Park is Canada's oldest national park. It was established in the heart of the Rocky Mountains in 1885. Originally spanning just 26 square kilometers around the Cave and Basin Hot Springs, it has since expanded to cover a vast 6,641 square kilometers of unparalleled mountain scenery. Over the years, Banff has become a symbol of Canada's natural beauty, drawing millions of visitors annually. Its lush valleys, snow-capped peaks, and turquoise glacial lakes offer a breathtaking backdrop for countless adventures. It's in fact a living ecosystem, home to a diverse range of wildlife from elusive lynxes to the iconic grizzly bear. The relationship between humans and wildlife in Banff has always been complex, and as the park's popularity grew, so did the challenges of ensuring the safety of both its visitors and its animal inhabitants. There have been encounters, some peaceful, and others more confrontational. For Doug and Jenny, venturing into the wild wasn't a mere pastime. It was a meticulously planned endeavor, sort of like a testament to their respect for nature's unpredictability. Their preparations were thorough, in fact, almost ritualistic, and before embarking on any expedition, Doug's uncle Colin, their trusted point of contact, would be looped in. I would get a phone call saying, we're gonna be going out on, at this date, this is where we're going, we'll send you the information. And I would get an email with a complete itinerary saying, every day this is where we're, this is how far we're going, these are the places that we're going. He'd first receive a call where the couple's enthusiasm for their upcoming adventure was palpable. This would be followed by a detailed email laying out their route, stops, and expected milestones, a roadmap of their journey. So last Monday, they started out. And Monday night, like every other time, I would, at the end of the day, I would get an in-reach message saying, we're at our destination, everything's okay. Every evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon and the wilderness settled in the nocturnal stillness, Colin would await their inReach message. And this satellite power check-in was in fact more than just a message, it was a beacon of their safety, sort of like a nightly routine that brought peace to those back home. At this time of year, the sun goes down and their routine would be, when the sun goes down, you go into your tent, you take out your e-reader and you read until you go to sleep. But that particular evening brought with it an unsettling change, an anomaly in their otherwise clockwork-like routine. While they tried to assure that all is well, the deviation from the norm was a subtle yet foreboding hint that not everything was as it seemed. As the clock ticked to 8.15 p.m., the atmosphere was growing more and more tense around Colin, and this is when the phone rang and on the other end was a rep from Garmin. The news was grim, and SOS, a signal that no one ever wishes to receive, had been triggered. But it wasn't just the distress signal that was concerning, it was in fact the accompanying three-word message, succinct yet terrifying. Bear attack, bad. So at that point, we, we knew something was happening that was very bad, that they were in trouble. Emergency services would then spring into action, mobilizing resources to reach the couple. But the vastness of Banff, combined with the unpredictability of the weather, would present formidable challenges. Before they phoned me, they would have activated, they did activate emergency services. So Parks was aware that where they were and that they were in trouble. 10.31, again I get a phone call from Garmin and Garmin at that point said a helicopter can't go there because of the weather, a team has been sent. It'll probably take them four or five hours to get there because they have to go by road. 
to get around and then on all-terrain vehicles so obviously we know that this is not good at all. They're in trouble and there's a big gap of time. Banff, with its dense forests and rugged terrains, is not quite what one would consider an easily navigable environment, especially under such adverse conditions. Every passing moment would at this point be crucial, but nature in its raw form wasn't making this rescue mission any easier. 1102, a call from a parks person saying virtually the same thing. No other, no other news other than that uh, the team was on their way. The initial SOS message, coupled with the chilling words bear attack, set off a flurry of activity among the rescue teams. But the rugged terrain and remote location of Banff meant that reaching Doug and Jenny wasn't so straightforward. The hours that followed were filled with a mix of hope, anxiety, and dread. Communication from the field was limited, making the waiting all the more torturous. Every ring of the phone was met with bated breath, hoping for good news. 1102, a call from a parks person saying virtually the same thing. No other, no other news other than that uh, the team was on their way. After navigating challenging trails and battling the elements, a rescue team would finally reach the park's boundaries. 325, I got a call from Garmin, again, that said the team was at the site, but no news. They were waiting for a helicopter to come when daylight arrived. Again, not great news. What does that mean? Is helicopter coming because somebody's injured or, or, or is helicopter coming because something else has happened? Their headlights pierced the darkness, revealing the dense forest that lay ahead but it wasn't long before they encountered the first signs of the bear's presence. Disturbed foliage, fresh tracks, coupled with the eerie sense of being watched. At 1.45 a.m., the tension reached its peak. The team going in, it's dark, but the lights saw something shiny off, in, uh, off on the side, and they put their lights on it, and indeed it was uh, an approved bear-safe food cache in a tree. Five minutes later, at 1.15, they were attacked by this bear, which, who the, in their words, meant them serious harm. The grizzly, an older female showing signs of poor health, but still of course more than capable of doing severe damage to a human, would launch a direct and aggressive attack on the rescue team. The team, trained for such encounters, but always hoping to avoid them, had no choice but to defend themselves, which is when the confrontation would come to an end, with the bear being fatally subdued. They obviously used their weapons and, and killed the bear. Pushing forward, the team's worst fears were realized. In a clearing, they found the campsite. The tent was flattened, and nearby lay the lifeless bodies of Doug, Jenny, and Tress. They set up their security, make sure there wasn't another bear there, and uh, then immediately found that, that uh, Jenny and Doug were both dead, uh, as well as their dog. The serene beauty of Banff, which they had both so loved, now bore witness to a heart-wrenching tragedy. The incident in Banff wasn't merely a headline, it was a stark, poignant lesson for adventurers. All appearances are that that's probably what happened. Their e-readers were out. The tent was flattened, obviously, but their e-readers were out in the tent. They were outside in stocking feet which again, it was wet out. It had snowed or rained that night. Uh, you're on a seven day trek. You don't go out and get your socks soaking wet in that situation. Your boots are right there in the vestibule to be put on. So you know that there was something going on that was very unusual. Doug, Jenny, and Triss's journey, while tragically cut short, underscores the unpredictable and untamed essence of the wild. Their story, laden with the joys of exploration, as well as the harsh reality of nature's indifference, prompts a solemn reflection among those that venture beyond its boundaries. If this episode piqued your interest, then our previous episode about a crocodile farmer that was dragged into a crocodile pit is likely to do the same. <laughs>